that the progression of Parkinson's could be slowed using gene therapy. Um, for example, with the use of a protein called glial-derived urotrophic factor. So what are genes? Well, genes, as we've already heard today, are short segments of DNA, um, and they provide our cells with the instructions to make proteins. So our, our cells need to be, to be told by our genes to make a protein like, for example, insulin. So in the human, we have 23,000 genes, um, and these allow the creation of all proteins required to produce cells and all tissues and organs in our body. So you can see genes are very important. So why are we interested in developing uh, gene therapies? Well, drugs such as uh, DOPA, um, or many such drugs, don't slow down the progression of Parkinson's but they are effective at treating the symptoms. So the principal aim of gene therapy is to try and use it to slow down or maybe even stop the progression of Parkinson's. So what kind of, of gene therapies are being developed? Well, the, um, we heard about these from Claire this morning, but there's uh, some examples of proteins that increase the levels of dopamine production and by that I mean they aim to increase the availability of the enzyme required for producing dopamine. And if you look in the research booklet that's out on the tables outside, there's an example of a patient who has actually undergone this type of gene therapy with um, a gene called uh, ProSavin. And a small number of patients to date have, are in a trial looking at the efficaciousness of this uh, what's now called ProSavin, which was originally designed and made in Oxford Biomedica. Um, another type of gene therapy is, could be involved in restoring the activity of nerve cells in the brain. Um, and Claire alluded to the fact this morning that um, in some patients with Parkinson's disease that there's an imbalance in how the nerve cells behave. So if you lose your dopamine cells in, your, in the brain, part of your brain becomes overactive. Um, and it's usually this part that's treated with deep brain stimulation. So there's a, a school of thought that if you could actually put in a gene into this part of the brain called the subthalamic nucleus, you could dampen down the overexcitation of that nucleus. And that might help with the symptoms of Parkinson's disease. And there is a gene therapy that's been trialled in the States, it's called uh, GAD, um, and it's an enzyme that is able to produce an inhibitory neurotransmitter, so i.e. it can dampen down uh, excitation in the brain and hopefully would restore the balance. Um, and that has been, a study has recently been published using this, but it only had a six month follow up. So to date, all we know is that it's safe um, and there was a 23% reduction in the UPDRS, which is the Unified Parkinson's Disease Rating Scale that's utilised to measure um, improvements in uh, motor ability. So that looks quite promising, um, but we need to see it being followed up over a longer stretch of time and obviously with more patients. Um, and a third uh, aim of gene therapy is to produce growth factors like GDNF, or there's another one called Neutrin, which is a closely related analogue or closely related factor to GDNF um, to try and promote growth and survival and help protect cells from further damage. Um, there has been a trial carried out in, in America um, looking at the effect of neutron on um, cell death in Parkinson's patients. And when it was administered to the patients in the first 12 months, they didn't see much of an improvement, and a lot of the patients actually dropped out of the study. But the patients that were followed up to 18 months began to see a progressive improvement in their motor rating scale. So, but the um, issue is that it was only administered to the striatum of the patients, which is actually, where, if you've heard about fetal transplantation for Parkinson's disease, the cells are always put in the striatum, which is where the gene therapy was put. 
um, but it didn't have an effect in protecting the cell bodies in the substantia nigra, which is where they're lost in Parkinson's disease. So there is hope for this therapy, but it may have to be injected at more than one site in the brain. Um, and I know that um, Michael J. Fox Foundation are considering funding uh, the second part of the study. So how are genes delivered to the brains? Well, um, in order to reach the brain, there's a lot of research labs looking at viruses, because we all know viruses are very infectious. You can get a cold sore virus that can infect uh, quite a few people, etc. Um, and we know they can be dangerous. So before they're used, they have to be changed um, so that they can, cannot reproduce or make more of themselves when they're put into a patient's brain, or obviously we don't want them to carry any infection. And there's many such viruses available in the research community at the moment, uh, like retroviruses, lentiviruses, um, or adeno-associated viruses, to name but a few. And it's this adeno-associated virus that has been used in clinic, clinically so far. So the two proteins I want to tell you about today are uh, CDNF, which is conserved dopamine uh, neurotrophic factor, and MANF, which is mesencephalic astrocyte neurotrophic factor. And these are a very novel family of growth factors, only uh, first described in 2007. Um, there's one member in invertebrates, but there's two highly conserved invertebrates. Um, and these are the two I'm talking about, MANF and CDNF. Um, we know that in the culture dish, they promote survival of dopaminergic neurons, but they don't have any effect on other uh, neuron or nerve cells like motor neurons or serotonergic neurons. So their effect seems to be specific to dopaminergic neurons. And both have been shown in earlier studies to protect um, in a 6 hydroxy dopamine lesion. So that's uh, quite a standard model of Parkinson's disease that's used in many laboratories. And that was simply by infusing the protein. So it was a once-off infusion of protein. It wasn't delivered by an antivirus. And there were a number of papers describing this. The first one to be described in 2007 was um, by uh, Lynn Tom and colleagues, where they showed that a single injection of CDNF into this rat model of Parkinson's disease could protect the dopaminergic neurons uh, from death. And they also tried administering it after the lesion, and they also found it to be protective under those circumstances. So, um, the purposes or the aim of our grant was to determine if both of these factors on their own or in combination could um, protect dopaminergic neurons in an animal model of Parkinson's. So um, this is you're not going to glean much from this slide, but it's just to show you that we made a number of viral vectors. And this is very much in collaboration with colleagues in Bristol, Professor James Uni and Dr. Liang Fong Wong, who are um, much more expert at this part of the project than I am, um, where we made a number of different vectors, one which just expresses GFP, so that's a control, it doesn't carry any genes. Um, then we have CDNF, MANF. Uh, we put in GDNF because we know GDNF should work from all the literature out there, it's sort of the gold standard neurotrophic factor. And then um, we made um, a combination virus of CDNF and MANF, so that they were both being expressed um, off the one vector. And then we needed to validate um, that the vectors were being produced. So all our vectors carry a tag which fluoresces green under the microscope, and that's how we know that we've made a proper virus and we can actually see it in our cells. So this is just a standard cell line, HEG293 T cells, um, and you can see the MOI means multiplicity of infection. So the higher the MOI, the more virus you're pushing into your cells, and you can see as you increase the MOI, the cells should appear greener. And then we needed to convince ourselves that the virus that we thought was expressing MANF was actually able to express the protein. 
And because of these red cells here, we can convince ourselves it's expressing the protein MAMF because we have an antibody against this protein. And then we needed to do the same for CDNF. The yellow cells here are both green and red, so our virus is working and it's producing our CDNF protein. And this again is just more validation which we need. Details not important, but just to show you these bands convince us with higher multiplicity of infection, we're producing more of our protein. Um, and the same here for this MANF. So we were quite happy that our viral vectors were producing proteins of interest. And um, then we decided to put them into rat cells, which um, was really because we wanted to put them into rat brains, we wanted to convince ourselves that they could um, be transduced into um, rat neurons. And this is an example of CDNF, and the nice yellow neurons have taken up the virus and also secrete the protein, and we get a similar result with our MANF virus. So we were happy to go ahead and do our animal studies. So this is the animal model we use, and as I say, it's very widely used for this type of experiment. So um, in a normal rat, so this is a schematic, this is the substantia nigra, where this is where the cell bodies, the little pocket of, of nerve cells that are lost in Parkinson's disease. And as these cells, um, the cell bodies are here, the cell projections up to the striatum, which is where the dopamine has been released. And so what the standard model is to give a lesion right here into the striatum, which if the dose is high enough, will carry the toxin back and you will get death of neurons here in the substantia nigra. Um, and then you, that gives the question of where should you put the vector, should you put it here in the nigra, should you put it in the striatum. Um, and as I said, a lot of the fetal transplant work was done by putting the cells in the striatum where they needed to be to produce the dopamine. Because um, you can imagine the distance here is quite long, and in the human, obviously, it's even longer. The neurons are even longer. So, just to show you what happened in the GDNF uh, animal studies, if the virus was put into the substantia nigra, it didn't restore the fibers in the striatum. If it was put into the striatum, it maintained the fibers in the striatum, and also in the substantia nigra. So our first approach was to try putting the virus into the striatum, because that's what we'd expect to work for GDNF. Um, and the question really arises is, do you need to have protection here and here, or is protection in one area enough? And that's the kind of question we're also trying to address. So this is the experimental design. It's, um, we did striating neurotrophic factor delivery first. So we um, lesion our animal and we also give the virus on the same day and we allow them to survive for eight weeks and we do some behavior um, during this time. And we use male rats for this. So what we found was in the first experiment where we put the, the virus into the striatum, um, it did work for, for GDNF. We did get um, a decrease in the bars here is indicative of behavioural recovery. So uh, Patricia explained about amphetamine to us a few moments ago. If you have a lesion on one side of the brain and you give the animal amphetamine, you will only have dopamine release on the good side of the brain, so the animal will turn. So if, if the one side of the brain is only working, your scores here will be very high. But if you have some degree of neuroprotection, you should be getting a balance between both sides of the brain, and then the number of turns should be reduced. And this is exactly what we saw here with uh, GDNF, but we didn't see um, as good an effect with either of our novel neurotrophins, which was disappointing. Um, and then we had a look at fiber density in the striatum, and again, GDNF worked as we expected it to, to do. Um, and then this is just an example to show you that our viruses are actually working in the animal's brain. 
This is green, which is expressed by the virus, this is green fluorescent protein, and cDNF is our novel um, protein shown here in, in the red dots, showing our virus is actually producing this protein. And we get a very similar result for MANA. The double positive cells are, appear more orange and yellow. So our viruses are definitely working, and that doesn't explain why uh, we don't get um, an effect on behavior. And then we had a look in the substantia nigra, which is where the cell bodies reside. And um, again, this is really the bar that matters. Only GDNF was protective under this experimental paradigm. So overexpression of CDNF and MANF could not protect our dopaminergic neurons. And we use tyrosine hydroxylase as our standard mark. And tyrosine hydroxylase is the rate-limiting enzyme for production of dopamine. So if you don't have that, you're very unlikely to have dopamine produced. So the question is why? Is there an insufficient amount of CDNF reaching the nigra dopaminergic neurons? And how about if we express the virus in the nigra? We know this approach hasn't worked for GDNF in the past, and we decided to try it. And then if we could combine delivery of the two growth factors in this paradigm by both of being expressed of the one virus, which is what we did. So when we do that, we get a very different result in that our GDNF doesn't work anymore, which is exactly what we'd expect from what's out there in the literature. But when we looked at our behavior, with the CDNF alone, we got a reduction in terms, and it was even more pronounced when we were expressing the two proteins together. So we were quite excited by that result. And then we had a look in, at the nerve terminals in the striatum, and found that, again, GDNF didn't work. This is an example of one that's very nicely protected. Um, this is a non lesion side of the brain here, so you can see the brown staining is what we're looking for. So GDNF didn't protect, there was a degree of neuroprotection with CDNF, we didn't see any protection with MANF, but when we had the two viruses expressing off the one um, virus, we act, two proteins off the one virus, we actually did see um, an increase, a significant increase in fiber density from both CDNF and CTM together. But then when we went to look at the cell bodies in the Niagara, we were quite disappointed by what we found because we'd seen behavioral recovery and we'd seen protection of fibers in the striation, but when we went to look at the cell bodies, we didn't see a positive effect of either of our viruses on the number of cell bodies in the substantia Niagara. So this really has uh, uh, given us more questions than it's answered because we don't know why, um, or we don't know if it's enough to have fiber preservation, to have protection of the fibers in the striatum and behavioral recovery. Is that enough to give a beneficial effect? It appears as if it is because we get a reduction in behavior. We don't know what's causing these new fibers to be present in the striatum. So we need to look and see, maybe there's more cell division, maybe the viruses are um, causing the cells to divide. It's possible maybe that the virus is down-regulating our enzyme, our TH enzyme in the substantia nigra, um, and we need to look at um, another, other markers to really test out what's going on here. Um, so that work is ongoing at the moment. So just to conclude, um, when we uh, had a look at a, mod a model where GDNF works, neither MANF or CDNF worked in our animal model. Um, however, when we put the protein into the substantia nigra, it did protect the terminals in the striatum and gave us behavioral recovery. And when we had the two viruses together, we saw a remarkable uh, preservation of the TH channels. So we need to find out really what or why that's happening. And I'd just like to thank my group in Bristol um, and Oscar, who is the person who was funded on the innovation grant. He did a lot of the work that I spoke about today. And I'd also like to thank James Uni and Jan Fong, who gave us a tremendous amount of help in making the viral constructs. And I'd like to thank Parkinson's UK for funding this project. And thank you for your attention.